Boxing, as we know it in sort of the modern era, really started to come into focus for women in the 1950s. And most famously, Barbara Buttrick, known as the mighty Adam of the Ring, who's, in my estimation, a British national treasure, um, is really starts this off with, uh, in 1949. She had been born up in Hull in, in, in York and had actually done soccer, was very interested in sports. I should note that she's just tiny. She's not even five feet tall. She's four foot 11, tiny, tiny, tiny woman. And loved uh, soccer and loved picking the ball and just was always a very athletic person. Sometime during the war, she came across an article about Polly Fairclaw Burns as being the first female boxing champion. She looked at that and went, oh, my God, that's me. That's what I'm doing for the rest of the lo my life. I am going to box. So she fashioned her own like heavy bag. She made her own speed bag. She started to teach herself boxing. She found books on boxing. Certainly no one was going to teach her at all, but she fashioned her own methods for, for learning how to box. And as soon as she was able, meaning she, she reached her majority, she moved down to London and began to train at a boxing gym in London. And she was there a couple of months, was like a sponge absorbing how to box. She had a job as, I think, a, like a stenographer or secretary during the day. She'd come to the gym every night and just work and work and work. And the folks at the gym went, oh, this is a gold mine. <laughs> what, what, what are we going to do with this amazing young woman, Barbara Butcher, who by this point was known as the mighty atom of the ring, as in atomic bomb. So they uh, brought in, uh, started to, to reach out to get publicity, and they brought in uh, uh, newsreel companies came in to interview her and to watch her work out, and everyone went, oh, my God, she could really box. Wow. Ooh. And they decided what they would do is uh, put on an exhibition bout with her and a male fighter. Well, when that happened, all hell broke loose. The British Boxing Board of Control got a hold of it and went, oh my God, no, 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 no. Women may not box. You cannot have a woman and a man. No, 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 no. And got to the point where the theater owner was threatened that his theater would be closed down if he showed a woman and a man boxing on a stage. Lots of hue and cry, lots of publicity in, in, uh, in the media of the time. And the decision was taken, no, we really can't have this exhibition with her and another man, or even her and a woman, because there really wasn't another woman necessarily she could fight. But what they did decide to do was continue the show anyway and have the show be all about Barbara Buttrick and her tremendous skills. So as the show goes on, they have all these kinds of acts, and at the end, she comes out. She's wearing all white. There's this green light on her, and she proceeds to perform uh, shadow boxing, and she works on various apparatus on the stage, and the place goes crazy. It's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. So she became this real force of nature. Unfortunately, she had no, cap no ability to actually practice her sport in a legal sense uh, in that that she was never going to get licensed in the United Kingdom. And I will add parenthetically at the same time, there were some women in Australia around the same size, which is really even funnier, who were also starting to discover themselves and, and their own boxing world. And there was talk of maybe bringing one of these women over to England and having some kind of exhibition. Nothing really came of it. But by uh, the summer 1949, Buttrick joined an existing troupe that had 
boxing and fairgrounds boxing, just the way her hero, her heroine, Polly Burns did. She was in tent boxing and basically the same deal. She was part of this troupe. They would go from town to town, fairground to fairground, and perform boxing shows. And then people in the audience would be invited up to fight her. And I think she she never lost. How could she lose? So she did that for a season. She, she did work for a couple of different uh, fairgrounds outfits. And then she did a season in France, which was apparently quite difficult. And then she and her now husband, who had been her trainer in 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 London, decided to make the move to the, to the United States. And she attempted to do boxing in the United States. At that time, there was this small little troop of boxers out of, of all places, South Bend, Indiana. There was a trainer who would work with women and he had four or five women who boxed. And they had these little boxing shows all around the Midwest often tagged with wrestling shows because if the local authorities found out that women were boxing, they'd shut it down. But if it was part of a wrestling um, show, they would kind of allow it to slip through. So there were women who were boxing right around the same time, 1949, 1950, 1951. And Barbara started to slip into a few of these shows. And she also began to do wrestling um, because there's really no other way for her to perform. And she would do individual wrestling shows, but mostly became, got into a circuit where she, uh, through the Midwest where she was on a tag team. <clears throat> so there was a very giant guy and another giant guy and a giant woman and little tiny Barbara, who was like practically half this woman's size. But they would uh, wrestle all over the um, the Midwest. And where she could get boxing shows, she would. And most famously, she boxed uh, one of the South Bend women boxers, a woman named Joanne Hagen. They put on what they call the championship fight in Calgary, Canada. So it really was an international boxing match, if you will. You had a British woman and an American fighting in Calgary. And... What was most impressive about it is that it was the first time a woman's bout was broadcast on the Canadian public radio, Canadian Broadcasting Company, CBC. Had a tremendous amount of publicity locally, as well as uh, syndicated around the world that this fight was occurring. And they did a really tremendous job. Now, again, you know, imagine... Four foot, four foot nothing, five foot nothing, Barbara Buttrick. And her opponent was this large, statuesque, beautiful blonde, five foot seven. So it, there was quite some discrepancy in height and size. But they put on, by all accounts, a really wonderful bout. Barbara lost, but she lost with dignity, if you will. She didn't get killed. She, she really held her own through the seven rounds, uh, through the rounds of the fight with, with Joanne Hagen. And by this period, she was started to be able to get more boxing bouts. And in, by 1957, she was able to obtain the first female professional boxing license to box in Texas. Um, so she does two of those fights. Um, and she was also able to fight in Florida, where she had moved, she was living in Miami at that point, and she was able to do professional boxing there. Although by, by now we're in 1960s and it's just petered out. All the women who had fought began to fight in the late uh, 40s, early 1950s, um, started to go on to other parts of their lives. So they really, or got married, started having children, so there really was no boxing life except for occasional little forays in the United States. The same thing in the United Kingdom. There's basically zero happening. But by <clears throat> pushing forward into the 1970s with the rise of second wave feminism and most importantly in the United States, the legal 
notion that men and women could not have separate employment, that their employment had to be equal. Women began to sue um, various boxing and state athletic organizations for the right to pursue a professional licensing as boxers so that they could earn a living as boxers. Now, that living was $100 a round, but it was still an opportunity. So um, 1970s, women are suing for the right to, to fight. Um, I will say wrestlers had been there as well, some female wrestlers, and there were some carve-outs in certain sh states for wrestlers in New York most uh, famously. But for women who wanted to box, it really was an uphill fight. In New York City, a woman named uh, who became known as Lady Tiger, first name, real name uh, Marion Trimier, and uh, a compatriot of hers, Jackie Tanawanda, whose name was Jacqueline Garrett, were invited by the folks at Madison Square Garden in 1974 to maybe put on some kind of boxing show. And maybe they'd find opponents for them or they'd fight an exhibition against each other. But in order to do so, they needed to get licensed by the state of New York. So they go down to the uh, New York State Athletic Association in Manhattan, fill out their paperwork for a license, and are promptly denied, which be noted that Floyd Patterson was then the, the chief commissioner for the New York um, State Boxing Authority, who had, himself had been a, um, a heavyweight boxing champion. And his thought was, ooh, women? No. Uh, 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 no, 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 no. So... Jackie Tanawanda, Jackie Garrett, sued New York State Athletic Association, uh, took them to court, and a judge ruled in 1975 that she had the right to pursue her suit on the basis of equal rights uh, as a civil case, civil matter. She, however, did not pursue it. I, I have never been able quite to determine why, but she did not pursue it. But it was taken up by a finer name, Kathy Cat Collins, two years later in 1977. And in October of 1977 was the first time that women were legally licensed to box in the city of New York or in the state of New York. And the three boxers who received their licenses were Kathy Cat Collins, Mary and Lady Tiger Trimier, and Jackie Tonawanda. Kathy Cat Collins and Marion Trimier um, went on to have boxing careers. Uh, for Kathy Cat Collins, there were some controversies surrounding um, her, some of her fights, but Lady Tiger uh, really made a space for herself out in California uh, and was in the first female boxing show in 1979. At the same time, you had women who were getting licenses in California and in Nevada. And so began the burgeoning women's boxing world that by, as I said, 1979 had, an all, had enough fighters to have all female shows and became quite a popular attraction at venues in Las Vegas and in La, uh, and Lake Tahoe in Nevada and was even shown um, at the Olympic Arena in Los Angeles. So um, it had some real popularity in those states in particular, but also in other states, and a real coterie of women who were the pioneers of the sport, women like Sue Fox, uh, the aforementioned Lady Tiger, Dora and Cora Weber, who went on to box all the way into the 1990s um, and, and still acquitting themselves remarkably well. This influence or this rise in the sport began to percolate again into other little places, into places in Europe, into Australia, into Canada, although very hard to find the details for it, but there are little tracks that exist. And by the early 1980s, 
it was an entrepreneur who came up with the idea of doing tough man and tough woman contests where basically the idea was you go in, you box for a round. And if you survived, you could, um, you, that you were boxing one minute rounds. And if you survived five rounds, you had the potential almost like a pyramid scheme to participate in other boxing matches. Well, uh, in the early 18, 1980s, Christy Martin was a st student in West Virginia and was enticed into one of these contests and did really well. And she basically began her boxing career as a tough woman champion. <laughs> so <clears throat> there were all these little avenues to boxing, real shows, not real shows, uh, Licensed, or licensed women who participated in the sport and, and funny little venues. Again, sort of like wrestling in the United States in the 1950s, which were in these small venues in small towns across the country. Same thing happened with boxing at this period of time. Small venues in the, 18, in the 1980s um, and starting to really attract interest in in the UK and in Ireland as well. So much so that by the mid-1990s, Christy Martin was being promoted by Don King and had her most famous fight was with the Irish fighter Deirdre Gogarty um, on the bottom of a Mike Tyson card on a pay-per-view show that ended up being the fight of the night and, and essentially is the date that boxing, modern women's boxing was born in the way that we think of it now, where there are appearing on real cards, getting televised and so on. Um, I should add that it, boxing in the 1970s, 1980s in the United States and in Britain remained illegal on the amateur side. So there was really no way for women to learn the sport other than to just say, well, I want to be a boxer. I'm going to go to a gym. I'm going to get the crap beat out of me by the men in the gym who don't want me there. And then I'm going to keep showing up day after day. And they're going to finally accept me and train me a little. And the next thing I know, I'm going to be in a professional fight. And that's kind of what happened. But it was illegal. So you had a woman like Jane Couch who came into boxing in that way, just was tenacious and said, no, I want to box, I want to box, I want to box, I want to box, and fought in illegal little club shows up and down the UK and kept fighting for the right to box professionally, taking the British Board of Control to court and finally winning in 1998. So boxing in the UK wasn't legal at all until 1998 for women, even though it had been had popularity on these, you know, for 100 years, well, almost 300 years, right? <laughs> in all sorts of venues. But it wasn't actually legal to fight in a professional boxing manner until Jane Couch really put her life on the line to win her court case. At great, at great cost, because it was very threatening. And there are those who really objected to the notion of women entering into the arena of boxing on the same footing as their male counterparts. All of this, however, did put pressure on amateur organizations. And in the United States, again, using the mechanism of civil rights cases and the notion that women and men are equal and that it was discriminatory against women to not allow them to participate in amateur sports. In 1993, a young woman named Dallas Malloy sued and, was, and won. And by doing that, um, Women had to, it, she won the right for women to participate in amateur sports across the United States. Now, there had been instances where women had participated in amateur contests legally. Those are done in individual states outside of the American um, uh, Amateur Union, AAU, which had sort of 
the jurisdiction over all amateur sports. In the state of Michigan, there was colleges would allow boxing, and there were certain championships that existed. There were also individual golden gloves that had women in, and they kind of allowed it. And then there was like shocking awe. Oh, no, there's a woman. We got to let her. Don't let her come. Don't let her come. But in 1993, it became legal across the United States. And in um, 1995, 1994, in New York, famously, a woman named Dee Hamaguchi applied for the golden gloves. And they said, oh, you're a woman. You can. And she said, oh, yes, I can. There was a lawsuit, and then she sued the Daily News uh, Golden Gloves program. And by 1995, the first group of women um, participated in the Golden Gloves. So out of all of that, again, it percolates around the world. And... By nineteen, by two thousand and one, I guess there was the first international women's boxing championships under the aegis of the uh, of IEBA, the you know International Boxing Association. And you had zone ten, twelve countries represented, and some really decent boxing. So out of that, so you have the. The push to legalize a woman's right to fight professionally. You have the push for women and young girls to have the right to box as amateurs. And out of that, you have suddenly the opportunity for these extraordinary contests that were held as world championships in the amateur sports. So you have the develop, starting to develop the bones, the lattice for the opportunity for women to compete internationally as elite athletes, where they start off by winning national championships, go on to uh, regional championships, such as the European championships, and then compete in these worldwide championships. All of this is what leads to IEBA putting a case to the International Olympic Committee to allow women to box in the 2008 Beijing Games. The International Olympic Committee says, "Mm, not quite baked yet, show us more. But but you're on our our list of really do we apply. We're telling you no, but it's not a hard no. It's a no now, show us more and we'll, we'll look at this. So by now, you also have the rise of this generation of talent that started as young women. Marlon Esparza, Nicola Adams, Clarissa Shields, Katie Taylor. And they are becoming national champions. They are winning bronze, silver, gold medals at the world championships. And by... 2010 at the Women's World Championships in Barbados, you had some really terrific women fighting each other and winning and impressing the International Olympic Committee so that by the time the case was made to the IOC for the 2012 Games, they said, yep, we're good to go. There was some challenge as to how many women could fight, what the weight categories would be, I think initially they wanted four weight categories and 40 women. That got pushed down to three white weight categories and 36 women. And they had to have no net gain in all of Olympic boxing. So some weight categories were eliminated for men. Didn't go over real well on the male boxing side, but it was like too bad. Aiba said, nope, we want women to fight. So... In 2012, it's the first time at the London Games that women have the opportunity to box. And if you think about it, it was closing that arc from 1904 when they initially did their first exhibition in Bloomers. And you fast forward 108 years. And it really brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. 108 years later, 
You have these 36 champions show up and say, no, we are here to do our business. And you had this extraordinary support. The decibel level was so high, people were putting plugs in their ears. It was the loudest they'd ever heard. And women fought, and they fought beautifully. They were amazing, absolutely amazing. And you had Nicola Adams won gold for London, for, for, for Britain. Extraordinary. First woman to win gold at her home games. Just extraordinary. And then um, it, at the uh, lightweight was Katie Taylor and Clarissa Shields won um, gold at middleweight. So uh, quite an extraordinary experience. And I think in, in, for the United Kingdom, it opened up a whole generation of people to the idea of, oh, women bop. Oh, they're actually pretty good. Whoa. Uh, there was a lot of promise to that 2012 Olympics and the thought of, well, they did great. Now we're ready for million-dollar boxing back matches, you know, in the professional side of the sport. Well, that didn't happen. It's kind of the big, like, um, now what? Kind of went nowhere. Women were still um, fighting on the bottom of cards, really uh, um, fighting in the United States. Other than in local markets, there was no national exposure of women's bouts on big fight cards, on television, just non-existent. Whereas in the 1990s and the early in the early 2000s, women were routinely on boxing shows. Somewhere around 2007, it just died. And the thought was, oh, the Olympics will revive this, but it really didn't. There was still a lot of machinations going on behind the scenes and a lot of pushing to get women to appear on major cars and more importantly, to appear on major media, mainstream boxing media shows on Showtime or ESPN, where they had appeared in the past. They didn't. And in the United Kingdom, you had the same thing. Non-existent, almost di very, very difficult to get fights and to appear on fight cards. Along comes 2016 and the Brazil games in Rio, Rio games. Nicola Adams repeats her gold. She's now a double gold medal winner. Clarissa Shields repeats her gold. She's now a double gold winner. Uh, Marlon and Esparza did not uh, participate. Uh, Katie Taylor did, she, she didn't medal, um, but the stars that had captured the imagination in the 2012 Olympics did appear, many of them. And at the end of that, women with double gold, <laughs> amazingly, there was sort of this notion of saying, well, okay, is now the time to cross over into professional sports? And it was deemed yes. So we had Katie Taylor uh, made her room with uh, Eddie Hearn's match room and uh, Clarissa Shields made her uh, eventual um, relationship with Salida Promotions. And they really pushed the envelope of the sport on both sides of the pond. And it is really 2017, to my estimation, that marks this current era that we are in now, where women are starting to have appreciation, recognition, and acceptance by the boxing world in general, by boxing media, and by fans.